Hello, welcome to the continuation of our Christmas lectures today. This is our final talk um, of, of the day today. And we have um, Cameron Van Loo with us today, who's going to talk to us about the good, the bad, and the ugly of season-based esports. So this is um, going to have, obviously, some relation to the talk we had yesterday um, that was esports-related. Um, but I, I can't remember, um, Jamie, you, you do partake in some kind of esports. You do... You do um, play some kind of esports games i don't know if my terrible ezreal mid lane plays count as esports <laughs> yeah, uh, they laughing are something down there. that i do <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm interested to hear some more from uh, again more of the lovely esports folks That's we nice. have at this university yeah. they always have fascinating things to say yeah. awesome so uh cameron we'll bring you up and we'll, we'll let you um we'll let you take over and uh, i'm excited to um learn more about um about the good the bad and the ugly of season-based esports hello hello so um one thing i just wanted to start off with was the fact that today's talk um was a little bit different to what i usually teach um as someone who teaches holistic based coaching and development mostly within uh relation to performance-based esports i guess in terms of higher echelon players uh, i wanted to sort of focus today on more i guess around game design um and sort of the principles behind it some of the rationale why developers choose different pathways and sort of the reasoning and rationale that maybe Riot Games has taken in this exact example. So today's talk is the good, the bad and the ugly about seasonal based esports. Um, today, um, as it's, you know, Christmas and we get into that sort of time of the year and it's all festive, I thought it was only applicable that I wore my Christmas jumper. So have to represent Psyduck once again. Um, but today, without sort of further ado, it's more about me being a little bit of a Grinch um, and talking to you about what developers sort of see in relation to their sort of freedom, sort of play, uh, free to play games and how they sort of marketize it a little bit better to our general audience. So the case study in question today is going to be Riot Games, a company that I've worked with for many years prior to working at the university, but still have uh, quite good connections with as we uh, sort of go through in terms of the time Whilst I've been at the university, especially Staffordshire University, I've, I've been able to bring some people in and to talk from Riot Games directly about their models and their strategies behind it, but also in relation to where eSports sort of is going and sort of where game design is going, I guess. So I thought I'll just have my little Poro there to keep me company. I did think about bringing my Poro in directly for today's uh, talk, but um, for the time being, you're just going to have to deal with uh, our emotional GIF Poro. So... And once again, Psyduck has to be represented. So these are the three questions that I want to really ask uh, you. And I want you to think about um, as I go through today's talk in relation to not just um, from a consumer point of view, but from a publisher point of view as well. So are publishers pushing too much for seasonal success? Um, looking at a, a range of different games, and I'll be bringing a range of different games into question today mostly focused around Riot Games admittedly, but we can also take into consideration Blizzard Activision, as well as Valve as well, as other sort of uh, free-to-play models currently being used. Fortnite's a really good example of this in relation to Epic Games, but one of the things that we see quite a lot is the fact of pushing a lot of business practices focused towards seasonal success. The next one is, are consumers' expectations becoming more and more unrealistic? And when I talked about this in particular was the fact that are we pushing consumer behaviors too far within our eSports sort of genre and are consumers and players feeling like they are too entitled to particular content in relation to their particular needs? The idea in terms of consumer expectation and burnout within publisher culture, um, and it's important to say uh, when it comes into this, um, Although I spend a lot of time talking about esports um, and esports in particular, one of the things that I'm mostly interested in outside of the development and process of players is around burnout as an overall principle. And one of the things that uh, is sort of quite apparent a lot with seasonal based releases and seasonal based updates is the fact that publishers do get a lot of, lot of burnout. Uh, we've seen a large turnover in staff, especially within the games industry over the last couple of years. And the expectations around burnout also come into question within this. So these are the three questions I want you to keep on asking yourself as I go out uh, throughout today's talk, but also in relation to sort of the wider scope as we think about it. Christmas is all about celebrating and highlighting success. And one of the things that we can see within this is the fact that not only is there seasonal success within games, and we see a lot of push for games, especially around this time of year with Steam sales, 
as well as a range of battle paths have been released. But one of the things that we can see is the fact that it puts additional pressure and workload in on publishers and how do they cope with these situations. So one of the things that I wanted to sort of highlight and sort of the academic underpinning of today's talk is around the West and the East. Um, one of the things that my students will probably know quite a lot about if uh, in relation to my two modules that I teach, which are global esports and managing the digital world, is this Western ideology versus this Eastern ideology. This is a slide that many of my students will probably recognize from a couple of weeks ago. Um, but Stuart Hall provided a critical account of the West in 1992, a uh, piece of writing. The underlying premise of this chapter is that the West is a, a historical, not a geological construct, as we can see within our map. Um, not all concepts within uh, the West uh, are universally accepted with, in terms of the global perspective. And as such, our Western ideologies don't always matter in relation to our Eastern audiences as well. Such society arose as a principle in terms of a historic period, roughly during the 16th century in the Middle Ages and the breakup of uh, feudalism. Those as a result of a specific set of uh, historical processes, economic and political and social, in terms of cultural, in terms of nowadays. We see this in relation to the beginning of capitalism. We see this in relation to the beginning of organizations which had power, the start process of IPs. Although this was all very much before games in terms of what we classify as digital games, we can start seeing how this is processed in terms of our rationale. One of the things that we can take into consideration within this is the fact that although Riot Games is predominantly a Western uh, company set up with the headquarters within LA, it's important to understand that as Tencent have taken further control over a very much a Chinese audience has also sprung up and arose from this. As we go past this, we can start thinking about the West as this sort of ideology in terms of terms, but also in terms of how this is virtually modernized and how this is modernized in terms of new retrospects and new ideologies. As we go through today's talk, I want you to think about this term as well in terms of why the West is important. So Western society in Western uh, sort of positioning within it usually comes into consideration within uh, what we would classify as English speaking countries, but also in terms of Europe as, as a whole, really. This Western ideology was sort of spread across Europe in particular, Americanization during World War II. Um, and we can sort of see it within uh, what would be classified as the predominantly whiter colonies of the British uh, Empire. Um, South Africa could also have been considered on this, but it sort of changed its ideology in terms of having a more African focus, which is much more suited towards their current demographic. So this Western ideology and this Western society situation, for the most part for a, for a long period of time, was pretty much the dominant force in terms of what we would classify as cultural influences within the UK, but also more cultural influences that you've probably have been brought up with. So in terms of active rank based players, we can start to see the the audience for esports in terms of the West, in terms of League of Legends, is actually significantly smaller than what it is in terms of the East. Um, and when we think about this, there, there's a few things that I want you to think about is the fact that when we think about holidays in the Christmas period and what we classify as Western ideology in terms of Santa Claus and the red suit and uh, even if we think about this in relation to Germany and France and in Krampus and sort of this ideology called sort of process of Father Christmas, we can start to think about it in relation to being quite a small uh, and quite limited part of the general player base. For example, if we combined NA, EU West, EU NE, and Australia or Oceanica, as it's referred to in relation to League of Legends, we can start to see the fact that it only makes up a relatively small part of the player base. Taking into consideration Southeast uh, uh, South America as well, again, this still makes up less than 20% of the player base. This is primarily due to the fact that Japan, China, Southeast Asia make up a significantly larger portion of the player base, making up approximately three quarters of the player base, if not slightly more. As such, um, countries that don't particularly celebrate Christmas or the festive period have to be also accommodated within this. And as we go through this sort of talk, I want you to think about the relations to the sort of larger player base and their considerations as well. With those things in mind, let's talk about Snowdown. So 
we talked a little bit about the West and the East and the fact that the holiday period isn't particularly celebrated for the vast majority of the player base, with the Chinese New, New Year being much more significant in relation to this. But when Snowdown was created in terms of the first iteration of Riot Games, it was very much aimed towards the West. This is the first event launched for League of Legends after the launch of the game in 2009, Snowdown. Snowdown was a game mode created to celebrate the holiday season and was the first major event after its release. It's important to understand the fact that the holiday period and the relation to the holiday period was very much targeted towards the audience that Riot Games at the time, or Riot Game at the time, if you want to go into Pantanatex, um, were really aimed towards. It's important to understand the fact that the vast majority of their player base was still within North America in, in Europe at this time. And there wasn't particular service for Asia and the player base wasn't really there. The map was a direct visual update as well as releasing five winter skins. And we'll be talking a lot about skins today and the passion and the sort of viewpoint of skins. These being for Zillion, Nunu, Timo, Tristana and, uh, and Nidalee. Um, some of these skins you will probably have had, they probably come in loot boxes, they are legacy skins. They were the first re really reiteration of what we classify as winter skins nowadays. And the process in terms of their design process was to sort of bring players who had invested early or early adopters of the game something to celebrate around the festive period. Um, one of the common business practices at the time, especially in 2009, was the fact that um, most games would have an update during the winter period. If any of you play Call of Duty or um, e any of the early battlefields, you would have seen some of these in terms of the games and the mechanics behind it. We also saw the fact that most games at the time were still very much on console and or had console-based audiences as well. And as such, these games were sort of taking a step in terms of this new model in terms of freemium or free-to-play models. So what Riot offered during this, so um, as we go through this, I'm going to highlight what Riot offered in each particular year. I'm going to skip over a few parts of it because um, some of you will probably remember parts of it and you'll have particular seasons that you you have some nostalgia over. And please uh, do leave comments in the uh, about parts of your period of playing Riot games or any of the League of Legends, Valorant, etc. in some of the processes they've done over the years. So 75% of Ruin pages Back in 2009, you had to pay for runes, like they didn't come together. Um, and it was something that you had to go around with. Um, and it's something that you can take into consideration as well. <coughs> Pardon me. So um, I'll come back to your comment just a second, Stardust. I, I really want to sort of highlight some of these comments and I'll go through them in between slides. So unique runes, uh, mark of critical candy came 2.2 critical damage. Um, we also had Utiled, uh, Yuletide and Glimpse of a Special Stocking, as well as a range of other particular ruins, which purely came out for what we would consider winter-based events. Um, these rune pages were last and they went back to their original forms after the winter period, but they used to come with a 75% off process. Um, if any of you played League under the old rune pages, you will have been able to see the fact that they had limitations in terms of what you could build. They were pretty much just stat buffs. Um, most of the champions at the time were staff, uh, stat buffs. If any of you play League of Legends now and didn't play at the time, just think of pretty much every champion was a little bit like Mundo in terms of stats being the major sort of process in terms of building it. We also started to see some changes in terms of uh, icon. So eggnog, um, there's an eggnog icon, which is also to represent potions and pots. And the map was designed with Christmas with visual changes to the map and turning the iconic Summoner's Rift into a winter night battlefield. Remember, this was two months after the launch of the game. There wasn't a huge amount of information. Right, first comment here from Stardust. So how uh, would you create an event that caters to both Western and Eastern cultures? Um, it's quite difficult. So there's, there's two things that I want to think about when, when it comes to these question, that question is, um, if you're catering towards a Western gaming audience, uh, there is a lot of similarity between a Western gaming audience and an Eastern gaming audience. Um, to accommodate to both um, can be quite difficult, but you can have particular audience segmentation, which will allow you to sort of cater towards both. Um, most of the sort of process in terms of catering towards both is to make sure that 
Eastern audiences have casters that they relate to, as well as Western audiences having casters that they can relate to. Having a lot of freedom in terms of your content creators and the, the processes behind that will allow you to have the best overall experience. One of the things that um, I always tell my students and one of the things that I always highlight is the fact that you're not expected to know everything um, because you aren't uh, an expert within Chinese culture and I'm not an expert within Chinese culture. So I wouldn't want to give you um, false information about how to run an event directly targeted towards Chinese uh, audiences. But one of the things you could do within this is to have someone who's already got a large following within China to sort of support that stream on Chinese based platforms and also allow uh, sort of integration within their sort of servers and rationales behind it. One of the things you may see within this is the fact that within this audience and this audience disparity, you may end up seeing the fact that um, they will be able to highlight things that you are probably not aware of. Um, and that's okay. Having multiple people come together, especially within organizations and international practice, is really, really beneficial. I hope that answers your questions, uh, question in terms of that. I'm, like I said, I'm quite happy to jump in terms of questions at any point. Um, so this was the first year what Riot offered in terms of it. It wasn't particularly amazing. Um, it was just after launch. What what we'd been seen as a, a sort of the first off event. There was a lot of praise to Riot at the time for this. The player base was um, relatively small. And it was important to understand the fact that this was sort of seen as a, a good sort of starting point. Um, a lot of public sort of nostalgia also stemmed from this particular uh 2008 reintroduction. So 2010, uh, new winter animated uh, login screen uh, with winter updated music for login. Um, this is the first year that they had an animated screen. It was just after the first sort of reiteration. Eggnog returned in terms of potions. Uh, we also saw the runes returned again um, with the winter runes also coming into consideration. Um, and this was the year that they released the most winter skins. Um, I have, I think, four out of the seven which were released. Um, this also was a release of my least favorite skin of all time, Ragdoll Poppy, if you can see at the bottom there. It terrifies me to this day. Um, and it's just a very ugly skin. Um, it's important to understand that within this sort of first of iteration, we could see that at the time, League of Legends were releasing a hell of a lot of new champions. Um, especially towards um, the between 2009 and 2011. And at the time, they were also releasing a range of new skins. Um, most of these skins you can still get over the Christmas period. In particular, Santa Gragas is what, uh, the fan favorite and is probably the only one that's still regularly played to this day, as well as uh, Reindeer Cogmore and uh, Amumu. The rest of the skins have seen uh, new or better skins being released for them. But uh, Santa Gragas is still probably one of my iconic and most favorite skin from the skin line. Um, it's also important to understand that at this particular time, uh, Riot were really, really pushing to get skins into the game, really pushing to get new champions into the game. The player base was growing and growing. New champions were being released every two weeks for this period of time, and they were for the next couple of years moving forward. So 2011, Snowbedinger. Toy Soldier uh, Gangplank, Miso LeBlanc in Festive Maokai. 2011 was sort of accommodated within this. The winter login screen came back with new art and new screen accommodated with a new winter uh, song. So this is the second year in a row that Riot released a new uh, song. Um, the biggest in-game changes were minions get uh, getting a festive look added to them. So I love these little minions. Uh, they did get a new update, a visual update relatively recently, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, four skins were released, like I mentioned before. Most of these um, haven't really seen a huge amount of play since the release. Snowmaninger is probably the only one that's seen regular play since then. Um, is the skin economy the same like CS, for example, that the older skins, uh, the more valuable it is? So one of the things that I want to highlight within this is League of Legends skin economy is very different to, I guess, CS or anything that's run on the Valve marketplace. And it's important to sort of highlight some of these things. The value of the skins are less as they get older. So Riot usually increases the cost of the skins. This is because there's new visual updates in terms of the newer skins. They have um, pixelated graphics or pixel-based graphics. They have uh, a range of different sort of 
imagery that go uh, imagery that goes into it, and the fact that they usually have more interactions or uh, visual uh, interactions with in pressing Q W E R, for example. Um, those are the differences. So the more uh, more expensive skins, on average, are the more up to date skins. There are some little changes in terms of that. In relation to something like CS, there's a comparison. The market is influenced by the amount of skins that are available to the market, um, and it's a free owned market. So you own the skin, you can transfer it out the game, or you can sell it to someone else. In League, we don't really have that. Um, as such, and I thought about doing a whole talk on this particular area, as such, the value of your skin is only linked to that account. Um, and one of my classes that I talked about quite recently in terms of multidisciplinary teamwork in relation to toxicity was the fact that the value of these um, skins are only linked to that account. So after you brought them, you can't transfer them anywhere. Um, this brings in another question at some point else, which would be what happens if League of Legends dies or League of Legends goes to League of Legends 2 or something along those lines, are the skins transferred over? And I think that's a question that Riot will have to answer in a few years' time if they make a new game. I hope that answers your question. In relation to CS, yes, they could be compared to NFTs. Um, they can be um, transferred over. They have value outside of what would be classified the game. Um, whilst I guess League of Legends skins are, uh, are stuck to that particular account. Um, and it's something that you, as a, a game developer or a development sort of uh, someone who works in terms of skin development or creation, etc., you have to take into consideration that it's all right no worries so that's what i would classify nfts are what we would classify as um very similar in terms of particular csgo skins um again i hope this answers your question like i said i quite like having breaks in between where people are asking me a range of different questions so 2012 um some of you may recognize this logo in the bottom corner here um it's a logo that josh jarrett uses all the time so um one of the things that you will see within this is 2012 new login screen came back once again with the same music as the previous year so we start to see some repetitive processes um the eggnog on potions was removed um we started to see some removal of different features um and was the first time since launch of a feature had been removed from this sort of winter update gifted skins was launched um in this year due to snowdown and was created in 2012 and originally was a limited time event originally within the game. So if any of you have ever gifted a skin within any of Riot Games' games, I'm pretty sure you can do it in Valorant as well as Lens Room Terror. You can do gifting systems. This all came from 2012 and Winter Summoner's Rift, I guess, um, was where we sort of see this. Many of you may have seen uh, some of the gifting process that went into it. Players were offered free wars for logging in and were collected when a player logged into the game um over a period of time i think there were over time there was two weeks of uh of events going on um and one of the things that you could see within this was the fact that the free skins and wars etc you had to log in uh, approximately once every two to three days to get all the rewards uh exclusive winter icons were released and these lovely ones down here were released and four new skins came in so we saw another year with four new skins, this being Dark Candy Cane Fiddle, Slay Bella Katarina, Bath Hunter Vigar, and Snow Day Ziggs. Um, the skins that are probably still seen the most are probably Bath Hunter Vigar and at this stage um, Slay Bella Katarina as well. Those are the two ones that you probably see a lot more than the rest. Again, these skins were uh, increased in terms of cost. They also saw an increase in terms of visualization as well. So 2013, um, again, we started to see a lot of different sort of changes within the game. Um, we started to see the sort of first reiterations or first proper developments, I guess, of esports in terms of what we would classify it as in terms of its global perspective. At this point, every major region had its own server. Um, and we could start to see a shift in terms of the player base. So like I mentioned before, in terms of the West versus the East, one of the things that you may notice within this is the fact that at this time, and I'm only talking about Christmas because, again, I have to represent Christmas with my jumper, is the fact that um, 
we started to see a change in terms of other holidays also being celebrated. So the new Lunar New Year thing started to come out. We started to see a big change in terms of these sort of processes. New login screen for this year, although music was uh, once again the same as 2011. So they didn't actually change the music. Um, and although Riot Games is very much renowned for their music and visual updates nowadays, in particular, if we think about Heartsteel or KDA uh, or uh, big areas within that, at the time, music wasn't really a priority for League of Legends uh, or for Riot Games as a whole. Um, it was not until very recently in terms of its sort of global perspective that music has become, a, I guess, a core fundamental part of their business model. At this time, we saw free skins being released um, within this. So, and they also saw an increase in terms of cost. They went from 975 RP originally to 1,350. So approximately in real, uh, in today's terms, it went from about six pounds to 10 pounds per skin. Um, and we also saw V skins being uh, Lulu, Singe, and Fifi. Uh, probably the most played skin out of V3, I guess, would be uh, Singe, because he hasn't had that many good skins since then. And it was something that um, was sort of taken into consideration. Um, no Summoner's Rift this year. This is the first year uh, due to a new sort of game mode being released. This is called ARAM or Howling Abyss. Um, it's probably the most casual game mode within League of Legends. And it was probably the first time that um, a fan-made map or a fan-made concept started to take hold. ARAM or all random or mid. Um, as it's longer term is called, was a game mode which was created by um, the community uh, on Reddit for the sort of the first point of view. And this process in terms of all random or mid um, was so popular in terms of custom games that Riot Games decided that they would add it as a game mode. New icons once again were given out to players for free and mystery gifts were introduced to the game for the win uh, for winter this year, war skins returned. However, this time instead of them being for free, they cost 640 RP. So we can start seeing the fact that the season rewards or season gameplay was starting to get very much priced into it. It's important to understand how this was sort of highlighted as well. Um, 1v1 and 2v2 showdown uh, was introduced to ARAM and was introduced as a one time thing, which is more. Uh, commonly used within the community in relation to a rule set for competitive 1v1s. Um, and one of the things that you may see a lot within games is uh, our 1v1 new. Usually it comes from um, back in the day in terms of the Call of Duty lobby, but um, at the time it was very much used in terms of a way to prove to players that they were sort of highlighted in terms of values. So you mentioned, uh, and this question from Red, uh, I'm not going to say that because I've read it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you mentioned about the East version of the holiday period. Uh, are the Eastern skins available in the West? Yes, they are. So 1v1 on Rust, don't at me. Um, <laughs> um, what, yes, so the skins, the skin lines, uh, one of the things that Riot Games does relatively well is the fact that all Loon New Year skins are available in the West and all Christmas or holiday skins are available, I guess, in the East. Um, on all their servers and platforms, they are able to um, are able to sort of highlight and use um, all the skins and assets that are created by Riot Games. Um, even when Tencent wasn't owned in Riot Games on the Chinese servers, they still got the same skin lines. The game doesn't really drastically change in terms of uh, West or East. There are obviously rules in terms of IP, LP, etc. But one of the things that we can see is the fact that all skins on whatever server you play on are still available. There are rules that have been changed and manipulated over the time. So Graves is allowed a cigar in terms of um, the uh, server which connects to the independent states. Um, but for the most part, we end up seeing the fact that this has sort of been changed in terms of it. Okay, next question. Would you say that exclusivity of skins uh, helps towards creating hype around purchasing for said event, uh, said skins? Yes and no. So um, most of um, most of the time, you will see that skins are released with a certain amount, and this is not just in terms of League of Legends, a certain amount of time that you can buy them. Um, we see the fact that certain skin lines will produce additional hype, but mostly this is in relation to loot boxes and crates. And we see this mostly within the CS community. Um, this is because particular crates go up in value or down in value because of an open market process. Whilst 
in League of Legends in particular, because skins can be re-rolled into at any given stage, um, these skins don't have the same sort of hype, I guess. It's mostly down to hardcore players in particular games, like particular versions of the game. So, for example, if you've got a hardcore Singe player, they may have been really hyped for the Singe skin in particular, because, but they are a very small part of the player base. Um, and these are what we would classify as one-trick ponies. Um, is there a pay-to-win skin on LOL, like COD, etc.? Um, I'm not going to say they're pay-to-win. There are some skins which give you a significant uh, advantage um, in relation to both the audience, um, but it's it's very, very minuscule in comparison. They're not skins that will instantaneously take you from iron four to like challenger um they are usually in relation to pixels and they're usually banned in competitive play so a good example of that would be something like high noon fresh um who's a particular skin within uh league of legends that you will have um you may have seen uh someone play at different times if not feel free to look him up it's quite a nice skin um, and that's because his hook is slightly less pixelated, uh, like pixel in the sight, like the line in terms of where the sort of hook actually reaches doesn't match the sort of visual representation. Uh, you will have also seen this in relation to the fact that uh, I Blitzcrank is also another one where his hook line disappears and it's only the front end of his hook that comes out. So it looks like his hand has been sort of removed. So it just goes up and up and up. Um, I love how I've done a representation of that. Um, uh, yeah, I know in Call of Duty League uh, years uh, ago, banned weapons came uh, camos and player skins due to uh, blending issues. Yeah, so there are some visual uh, blending is issues with some skins, but they get banned for competitive play. Um, some people uh, in high reloads will uh, like ban people for it, but for the vast majority of the player base, it's not something that give them enough of a significant advantage. Yep, they ban camo for working. Um, so, 2014, the year of the Poro. And if we go back to my, my beginning slide in terms of my lovely Poro, um, I'm sad that I didn't bring it in today, but I was in a bit of a rush this morning. Um, this was the first, I guess, Christmas event um, that was really themed around a particular story or a particular area of the game, I guess, in terms of it, or a particular part of the law around uh, Legends of Root, well, of, of Rune Terror, I guess. Um, the new login screen this uh, time with new holiday day themed music replaced the 2011 Christmas music. They finally updated the music. Three new champion skins came uh, this uh, into the game. All uh, ch uh, new skins came into the game, all 640 LP and were horror themed. Um, so they actually had a drop in terms of the cost within this. Um, they then went up to 1350 shortly after the first time of doing it, but you had to buy them within that particular holiday period to get them for 640. New icons were released in relation to this, um, and we could end up seeing the fact that um, these icons were the first uh, holiday icons which actually cost money to buy. Um, there were three uh, icons introduced alongside the new limited time uh, game mode, which was called Legends of the Pyro King. And in the bottom image here, you can see the Pyro King. You may have seen him in a few slides ago as well. A theme, uh, winter themed hood was introduced to ARAM, which is already a quite wintry sort of themed event. Um, if you go on to Howland Bift, it's based in Freljord, which is what would be classified as a northern uh, sort of percentile, or what we would classify as a Scandinavian Canadian region, a region that's known for having long winters and snow. All holiday uh, skins were removed from Legacy, and people were able to buy the previous skins each year. Three new skins were released. So for a big period of time, up to 2014, all skins that uh, League of Legends were producing usually had a expiration date like you mentioned before was a hype around them some people brought them but um it wasn't so much in terms of hype but we they became legacy skins um which means that no one could really buy them in 2014 riot games decided that um because of a growing player base and it was still very much a growing player base at the time that they would allow people to buy these legacy skins over the winter period there was also three new skins released, this being Snow Day Maldahar, Winter Wonderland's Oriana, um, which I somehow have spelt wrong, so 
do apologize in that one. I should have my dyslexia warden at the beginning of this. And Parabride Sejuani. Okay, question from uh, the chat was, personally, would you prefer buying skins or grind to earn them? Um, personally, I prefer grind to earn them. Um, there are ways that we do this in terms of League of Legends. This is usually through battle passes or doing particularly well on a champion. You get a chest, etc. Um, there are talks at the moment in terms of Riot Games, and this whole talk has kind of been ruined by Riot Games, really, um, in the recent couple of weeks. Um, but they are looking to uh, introduce uh, earn skins um, to the game as part of their monetization process. The one trick ponies can earn in particular, or people who play a champion for a particular long period of time, are able to buy those, uh, buy particular skins or earn particular skins for those champions. What we see a lot within Smite, but also what we can see a lot within Call of Duty, right, in terms of prestige level. Um, but personally, I think uh, being able to earn the skins or earn value in terms of it is always beneficial to the player. It keeps players engaged. Uh, so all game designers out there, please do that. Um, because, again, you want someone, something that players earn building up that economy, building up that sort of community spirit and sort of value behind it. 2015, Pingu. So um, another sort of themed event around a particular winter-based character within League of Legends. Um, new login screen came in. Uh, for the third year in a row, we released three 1,350 uh, 1, uh, RP skins. Um, these ones didn't have the 640 RP sort of initial relaunch. Uh, three wars were released uh, like previous years, all 640 RP themed penguins. Um, and we can see they had a lot of penguin design within this. Three new uh, 250 RP icons were also introduced. And we can start to see the fact that not only um, did we start to see a shift in terms of everything was becoming monetized uh, around this time. The Power King game mode returned for a second year in a row. This is the first time we didn't see a new game mode being released in terms of League of Legends since the first couple of initial sort of snowdown showdown sort of matches. And they also introduced a leg, uh, they brought a legendary skin priced at 40, uh, 18 20 which is equivalent to approximately £16 during the event that were uh, given to uh, a free skin at random. So if you brought a legendary skin and there was a about 20 at the time, you were given a free random skin token as well. Um, you also released uh, My Shop. Um, and if any of you have played uh, League or you've played Valorant, you will have seen My Shop. And it's actually a common use within most games now where you can buy skins which are custom towards your target audience. So it's based on what champions you play or particular guns that you play. We call this in Valorant Night Market. So the one thing I don't really like is regional skins again. Uh, for example, Call of Duty does a lot of Burger King and Little Caesar skin uh, pizza. Only redeemable in NA, not EU. Does this happen in the league? No. Um, so all skins are released in terms of all all regions. Um, there is not any product placement within league in comparison. So um, a lot of games have like different IPs come into it. So uh, Smite, Call of Duty has uh, different IPs uh, connected to it. We've also seen it in relation to a lot of other areas as well. Yeah, so Tencent acquired right in 2011. And the, since then, the skins have been shifted from the theme of Christmas to winter, hence snow day. Yeah, so one of the things we can start to see is Tencent acquired a share of Riot Games in 2011 and then brought out the company outright. <laughs> ah, nice. Um, I'm not going to comment on that one. But yeah, Stardust, it's very much it started to shift away from what we would classify as Christmas and, uh, and more towards a winter sort of themed event. 2016 and 2017, we started to see a bit of change in terms of this, and you can see where I was going through this. I was running out of photos to use because at this time they were limiting the amount of things that they released at, at winter because they were spending more time focusing on Lunar New Year's, etc. So, new login screen, this was uh, uh, interactive uh, and the first fully interactive login screen by Riot Games um, also came out this time this year. Since then, we've had mostly interactive screens, but in recent times, especially with the development changes, etc., with the organization, new games come into the market, such as Valorant, Lens of Rune, Terror, and TFT, we can end up seeing the fact that these uh, interactive screens have sort of taken a backfold. Um, three new skins came out, again, third year in a row, well, fourth year in a row, they only released three new skins. Porokine game mode returned, so Poro King game mode, not Poro Kind, and new icons, which had additional Poro skins uh, attached, 
uh, for a limited time only. Emotes came out and games sort of changed within this. Holiday merch was released, so um, they started to release their own merchandise uh, lines in particular this, uh, and League of Legends uh, was part of Riot Games' initiative to have more merchandise, building around the idea of Legend Room Terror as a whole, and this sort of shift to build building the world around it. Um, and I thought about wearing my uh, Tibbers onesie, which was one of the first things they released on that store, which was part of the winter selection as well. Winter Summoner's Rift made its return uh, for 2016, first time since it uh, uh, was seen as the peak holiday season. We also started to see the fact that 2016 was sort of this big hype. 2017 also followed the theme and has smaller updates, different skins and merchandise lines. However, all main themes stayed the same. Uh, the main difference was the return of popular game mode Earth, so all random uh, ultra rapid fire, not all random fire, uh, ultra rapid fire, uh, but was a snow based theme. So uh, one of the icons was a snowball, and some of you who have played League may have realized that this all came from the winter sort of update. Was if you play ARAM in the snowball effect, that comes all from um, this period of time. So bringing my friend back into the conversation. Mr. Grinch, and that's pretty terrifying when I look at it up close, um, is the fact that the last slowdown in-game event was launched uh, in 2018. Chromers were introduced, a battle pass was linked to, in relation to the fact that battle passes were brought in as a new revenue stream outside skins, purchases, and loot boxes. The battle pass gained some uh, heat, however, after the time players got their heads around uh, it, they were happy with the value earned from it. Snow down in terms of the process and sort of the winter holiday was seen as a, a large way for a long period of time, not just 2018, where Riot could really generate some revenue. Um, and one of the ways that they started to do this was they used popular modes such as like Fortnite, etc. Other companies who were using the free play model, who were using this battle pass model, and they introduced it to their own games. The differences between uh, League of Legends um, uh, pass in say Fortnite or other platforms. Um, and I'm sure you can give me a range of examples, is the battle pass in League, you can't earn enough RP to buy the next battle pass. As such, you will have to buy each battle pass that they come through. Each battle pass themselves usually cost 10 to 12 pounds, roughly in terms of where it comes in terms of costing. TFT ones are slightly cheaper than um, League of Legends ones. Battle passes were the worst thing ever invented. Um, that's a debate for another day, I guess. But um, one of the things that I would say in terms of battle passes being one of the worst things ever invented was maybe the fact that um, I think loot boxes were, were slightly worse. Uh, I think battle passes have particular value um, and they gain value in terms of the cost. Um, it's about rewarding players who play a lot. I pay £30 for my battle pass for extra skins. Wow. Um, it depends on... Um, which game's that? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. So, staff games department, um, in relation to this, what do you think about Halo Infinite's method of having uh, some battle passes uh, you can uh, go back into in some premium passes? Um, I think the fact that you can go back to certain passes is quite cool. Um, there, there's been some really good passes over the years in relation to League of Legends that I would have liked to spend more time on. Um, if you buy the battle pass, you should be able to complete the battle pass if you brought it fully. Um, it shouldn't be time locked. I, I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, but one of the things that I will say is um, having premium and not, like, not premium battle passes um, comes with some limitations, I guess. Um, it does mean that there's going to be a particular hype around particular uh, parts of the game. And it also is a good way to bring people back onto live servers a lot of the time um, if you reward players for playing the game. Um, so this is, uh, you usually have £9 for one, and then they have 30 for one. So, okay, that's an interesting method. 
So 2019 to 2022, like we mentioned, Tim through it when Tencent had more control of the company. Some Christmas Lion skins were uh, were being released. However, Riot has decided to move away from this theme. No additional content has been directly made for the game for the holiday season, with Riot claiming to focus on larger map updates, such as Elder Dragons uh, and sort of the visual updates around dragons, with cl uh, Riot claiming to be focused on those sort of processes mostly. And uh, uh, set into a new season with Riot, how uh, now placed in line with the start of the calendar year. So when you think about this, since uh, 2021, we started to see the, the season for League of Legends sort of shifts around this. Um, one of the things that I want you to think about within this is the fact that Riot has sort of made their calendar in line with what we would call about the, uh, the Christian-based calendar, I guess, or the Western-based calendar. Um, as such, winter is just before they have to release their whole new season. Um, as such, we need to consider that it's not just about right hating Christmas. It's about the global concepts around it, where Tencent is a majority shareholder, uh, Eastern audiences are the majority buyer, and the audience hasn't really met, met too much sort of need for it. Like I mentioned before, there has been some community backlash, and these are some examples in relation to it in terms of the subreddit for League of Legends. Um, that I picked up this morning. Um, but for the most part, they've sort of fell into this sort of smaller community sort of based outreach or sort of viewpoints. There's no reason that Riot would come back in terms of having a winter map again. They've really claimed it's been too uh, effective in relation to the Dragon Spawn and the Baron Spawn. And if any of you've seen the update for 2024 or the new season coming into play, you'll see that there's going to even be more confusion in terms of how you would create a winter themed Summoner's Rift. So Roundup, it's not realistic that a game like League of Legends continues to put focus on a holiday which the vast majority of play player base doesn't celebrate. Um, it's important to understand that the, even though we, in the West we, we League of Legends is a very popular game, it's still not the, the major part of its audience. There's only a reasonable amount of time players will invest into Christmas skins, with many of these skins not being used outside the winter months. I have a range of Christmas skins. The only one that I don't play during the Christmas break and outside the Christmas break is Snow Day Bard, um, just because he has penguins and I think it's a crate skin. Um, but for the most part, I only put my winter skins on during the winter period. And this is quite common within most games. I think people generally will only use winter skins over the winter period. In-game uh, modes focused around winter, again, isn't applicable to many of the audiences. When we think about the map and we think about global warming, and it's not the fact that Riot Games uh, is going about global warming. It's the fact that the vast majority of their player base will have never seen snow before. It's important to understand the fact that having a winter focus is only, again, relatively applicable to a small part of the, the global audience. How do you feel about creator skins? Um, I think creator skins are great. Um, I wish League of Legends adopted them um, because I think it would be great in terms of opportunities, especially for students. We, we have a concept art course and a games art course at the university, and I've seen some of their skins, and they're fantastic. Um, but again, how you regulate that to make it um, consumer friendly is very very difficult and uh, Riot Games I don't think will ever go towards that model because of the fact that they are worried that the quality will not match what they expect within their game. I think we talked a little bit about this last year, well I talked a little bit about this last year um, in relation to that. So, but hang on, wait, 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 wait. Riot Games had to ruin my talk. So thank you Riot once again for ruining my talk because they always seem to do. Um, Riot ruined my plans. So this year, Riot came back with winter-based skins uh, and completely festive Riot has returned with winter skins and spent some time ending their season with arena mode, which is a new mode that they tested out during the year. Um, and once again, Riot Games decided to um, break their client. And one of the things that you would have seen recently if you play League is the fact that every time Riot tries to release a new content, they end up breaking their client. So. Some cool skins released with a new a battle pass this year. It's lovely to see um, some new skins, and uh, and they look great. I'm not going to lie, um, but we're probably never going to see a winter summons rift. We're probably never going to see some of what we would classify as old game, like old nostalgia around games. And it's important to understand that. 
So, any questions? And I'll try to keep it to time because I know Ben and um, Ben and Jamie have had a very stressful and long day. How do I feel? Uh, I've already talked about how I feel about crazy skins. But how I feel about crazy skins, I think they're great. Hello, Jamie. Hello. I figured I'd jump in. How are you doing? Yeah. That was a really cool talk. Thank you for that. Uh, it um, was it was very much about just having some fun, I guess. Um, in mm. terms of it. Um, yeah, the skins look great, but everyone wants map. Yeah, I think that's true. I think the the map is um, what people would love to see again. Uh, I don't think he will ever come back in relation to Riot is very much focused towards uh, a particular player base who care about their rank a lot. I am one of those sad people. I'm not very good at ranked, but I'm one of those sad people. So I, 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 I don't do think that. it's. I don't think it's you know, to make you a sad person for enjoying a game and wanting to be competitive, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's what we enjoy. I, I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't really, like, the context of Christmas, I hadn't... I, that was very interesting because, like, you'd think, like, it's like, yeah, of course they're going to celebrate Christmas, right? But, you know, the bulk of their player base isn't even, isn't even huh. here. With that. So that's really... It was interesting to think about that. Um, because like normally there's something like Overwatch normally do like a um a, a Christmassy thing. I've last night played Overwatch last yeah. year. Yeah, so Overwatch um is a, again a, a very sort of different uh sort of beast with it. Uh, Blizzard Activision as a development team are very much still primarily based in North America. Um. Mm -hmm and very uh, western centric um i so i think that's probably why with league of legends having quite a large ownership by tens and a chinese company i think it probably shifted a lot more um towards that particular audience the mm -hmm. scale the scale and distribution i guess is also something that needs to be taken into consideration mm -hmm. whilst um blizzard uh, and overwatch in particular um has a, a eastern audience i guess especially within korea in terms of competitive play um it's still very very small in comparison especially with china shutting down their service for overwatch um obviously chinese overwatch was very very big um but with uh the ccp taking into consideration the, yeah. the closure of it um i think it's still very much targeted towards the western ideology um a lot and i've probably would have to say that that's why uh when the common denominators i guess that's interesting what's what's your favorite competitive game i'm gonna guess it's league but if if it isn't league what would be your next no, so uh it's definitely league it's one that mm -hmm. i've obviously done the most work in uh, i guess over the years um, yeah uh, I was coaching League of Legends for a long period of time. Before I worked at university, I worked with different esports teams for a long period of time as a consultant. Um, so I would say League is probably my the game that I watch the most um, and probably play the most. My favorite game in terms of, and this is going to sound really bizarre as an esports person, but uh, my favorite game to watch in terms of an esport is actually Football Manager. Oh, really? I love football. Manager. That, that, that you're right. That that is a bit. That's interesting. Um, what, what what is it you like about it? Well, I'm a I'm I did an accounting. Is my my first degree was in well my second degree was in accounting. My first degree mm -hmm. was in mathematics, um, and I love numbers. Um, from from, uh, from 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 the age of three, um, mm -hmm. I used to do spreadsheets of football tables and create my own <laughs> football league, um, and it's just something that I've always I guess loved and i i just think uh having that sort of football database is great um i was teaching my class this morning actually my level four class and they were we were just talking about how do you know so much about some random team in like the smallest part of the uk i was like because i play so much football manager um so yeah that's my my favorite game but um <laughs> the platform in terms of that um i i think you could probably give um one of the games uh jam groups that and they yeah. probably create a more visually stimulating game than what the manager is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome <laughs> uh yeah J jgm said uh not, not f123 no 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 um <laughs> uh, uh i do uh, i do like f1 um i've got used to the the fact that we run the alpine community cup each year mm -hmm. um they ran it last year and it's going to be run again this year um and we have a lot of students who like uh, sim racing because of it, and we obviously have good links to the university, I guess, to F1 teams now, especially around esports. So mm -hmm. um, it's important to sort of highlight 
I don't particularly like F1 um, as a person behind it. Um, I, I, I have a real, <laughs> I, I've, I've upset a lot of people. Um, I'm upset. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I'm, I'm quite happy to upset people in relation to that one. Um, but I do support Alpine because they're obviously a very good link with us. And every time I watch them live, their cars break, so I've stopped watching them live. <laughs> um. David Murphy asks, have you seen any examples of player resistance to Western ideology, um, or ideological dominance um, in the cases that you've examined? Oh, David. Uh, is oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a really spell. interesting question. Um, it's very sort of difficult um, in relation to um, seeing if there has been some negativity, um, I guess, because a lot of the forums that I've looked at in relation to Creative Today's uh, sort of lecture were very western focused um reddit is very much western pl uh, platform mostly used by the west there has been some uh ideological shift i guess in terms of um more political more than what we would classify as individualized so um the ccp chinese communist party um I'm, i've used that acronym quite a lot i probably should have highlighted what they what it was um were very much insistent in terms of limiting what we would classify as gamification right um in terms of exploitation of youth that's why they put into into place a uh, game addiction as a law and sort of the process in terms of game uh, game and play was the fact that they didn't want uh, too much western ideology and western exploitation so there there has been uh, elements in terms of political standpoints in relation to um sort of players it's a little bit different. So because most esports leagues or esports competitions will have a Eastern league, which will have a very Eastern perspective on, on it, there hasn't been too much shift in terms of changes through that. And because uh, the East, especially in Korea and China, to the larger gaming audiences, has their own titles that they also focus around, I feel, uh, I, I feel at the moment the people who decide to play Western games or Western-focused games are a little bit more sensitive to uh, uh, more sensitive and realistic around that thing, uh, that particular area. There hasn't been a huge amount of backlash. Actually, I think the one the one example of backlash I did get in relation to this was um, around the release of the Loon new uh, Lunar skins, um, which was quite taken aback by the American Asian audience in particular, um, or first generation uh, Asian. Um, migrants who were thinking that it was very much Western exploitation of Asian culture um, more than anything else. That, that's that's interesting because I one half of me thinks that's like great for inclusion and like yep. trying to include um, you know other um, cultures um, holidays but I can also see how that that can also be like really super commercialized as well so yeah that, that's that's very tricky um, that's very it's very interesting. Um, to think of. Um, um, so um, we will uh, wrap up for um, for today as we are coming towards the uh, the close of our talk. So Cameron, thank you very much for um, for coming to us today and um, talking to us about, um, um, about how the seasons affect esports. That, that's yeah. something I've never considered before. So I feel like I have, uh, I will leave today enriched. Um, thank, thank you for having me. Everyone to um, commenting and um, taking part in the talks. Um, tomorrow we kick off at um, twelve again as usual, and our talk is going to be with Robert Lambert, and we're talking about how we are bringing heritage to life. Um, so if that interests you, please come and tune in at twelve to one uh, tomorrow morning, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you very much.